I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. See, now the plan had been that we would have a time of prayer. Pray for your needs. Because I believe that the Lord spoke to Dawn this morning, saying that he was going to meet needs in this room today. Not just in this room. But if you're hearing this message, I pray, pray confidently that God will meet needs in your life. The reason I wanted to speak first is because if we're going to pray, we need to pray in faith. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So I'm praying that, that before we pray together that way, that, that faith will be stirred up in our hearts and our lives. And the other reason is, I'll go back and Dawn said, if you have a need, raise your hand. And she said, Every hand should go up. We all have needs. But one of the questions is, do you actually know what your needs are? Because God may direct you to think or rethink your needs before we have that time of prayer. So, I'm going to share with you the message that God gave me. But before I do that, I'm going to pray, Father, that you would not allow me to speak what I have not heard from you. And Lord, that you would stir up faith in our hearts, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' name. I don't know what you think you need. Did you hear that song we just sang? Just a closer walk with thee. What does it say? Hmm? Granted, Jesus is my plea. Is that your plea? Is that what is that what you see as a need in your life that you pray for? A closer walk with Him. How about that other verse in that song? Just a closer walk with Thee. I should have you come up and sing it again. What's it say? I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Before, you know, there's another question, about not just about need. And by the way, you can sit here and you can think and prepare yourself, think about your needs. But I want you to know that before you can think or ask, God knows. God knows far, far, far better than you do actually what your needs are. And I want to tell you this morning that God wants to grant you the desires of your heart. And I pray that before we're through, He may have changing, be changing the desires of your heart. Are you satisfied? Are you content? Are you satisfied? Are you content? Are you satisfied? I keep saying this every time I'm here. If I ask a question, I actually expect an answer. Silly me, eh? Forbes magazine last year did a survey. They said more than half of all Americans are unhappy at work. Majority of Christians are unhappy when they go to work. They're not content, they're not satisfied. A Harris poll stated that only one-third of Americans are happy. Now, that's not just a momentary flick, but a consistent thing. The, the WHO, WHO, the World Health Organization, not long ago they called depression a global crisis. Now, if there is a word that describes being unhappy, dissatisfied, malcontent, it is the 
depression. Isn't that true? Before I got saved, I was a president of a small advertising agency up in New York. And I knew what the task of our company was. To reach out and make you dissatisfied. Dissatisfied with what you have. Because if you're satisfied with what you have, you're not going to buy what we're selling. It's the truth. The world works so hard to get you dissatisfied. And the world is dissatisfied. I flew in the U.S. Navy as an air crewman, so I go to the VA. I don't know, anybody else in here use the VA at all? I was astonished. It was not too long ago that they started their process a little different. Before you can go and see the doctor for my regular checkup, before I see the nurse. And, you know, the nurse, they do these pre-doctor things. They take your blood pressure and your temperature and that kind of stuff. Your vitals, they call them. Don't ever let them take your vitals unless they're willing to give them back. Okay. But what astounded me is the process today is different. Before the nurse takes my temperature, before she takes my blood pressure, she starts asking me questions that they are now required to ask. Do I have suicidal thoughts? Is anybody in my household harming me? These are the questions they now regularly ask because they are so common. Do you know how common suicide is? Over 40,000 people in the U.S. committed suicide last year. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world committed suicide. That is the epitome of despair. You know what despair is? You have no hope. You have no hope. I said to Vicky, I might have asked for a different song. But it's not in your hymn book. I can't get no satisfaction. That's the extent of what I know about that song. The Rolling Stones got famous with that song. They sang that song for the first time in 1965. I wasn't into that kind of music, but I remember that well. 1965. Do you realize that is 50 years ago? Now, if that doesn't astound you, this should. Not long ago, the Rolling Stones did another concert. I mean, I'm about to turn 72. These old guys are bouncing around on the stage. I mean, and they're still singing. I can't get no satisfaction. Will somebody tell them? Will somebody tell them? Will somebody, if you happen to run across Mick Jagger, will you sit down and tell him? Jesus Christ said that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Amen. There's an answer. There's always been an answer. But people turn to antidepressant drugs. They turn to everything but Jesus Christ. That's not the answer. Talking about old guys. How about Abraham? <laughs> Abraham was an old guy, you know. It says that in the Bible. It says, he breathed his laugh last and died in a ripe old age. An old man and satisfied with life. That's Genesis 25 verse 8. He was satisfied. He had something that the Rolling Stones didn't. He had something that most of the world didn't. He had a hope. He had a God of hope. He knew that his needs were cared for. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. But it says, it's still in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, continued on, and said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know that verse? Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will be taken care of. What you eat, what you drink, your clothing, your food, all of that. If those things are your need, how do you fulfill that need? I'll tell you how. By seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's how. Sometimes we get up, we're, we're, we're looking in all the wrong places. The Rolling Stones are looking all in all the wrong places for satisfaction, for contentment. But so much of the church today is still looking in all the wrong places. 
God wants to give you the desires of your heart. Do you not know that it says in Psalm 37? It says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. You know that? That's another question, guys. If you don't, go read it again. Psalm 37. It's verse 4. But I'm going to tell you a truth. That when you delight yourself in the Lord, He becomes the desire of your heart. You recognize that your needs change. Your needs are not food and covering. He'll take care of that. That's His promise. You know what your need is? A closer walk with Him. That should be your plea. That's what you need to recognize as your need in your life. He'll take care of all the rest. He wants to give you the desires of your heart, but He wants to be the desire of your heart. Eve, the woman. God made Adam. Took Eve out of his side. I want you to listen to this, women. She had it perfect. She lived in a perfect place with a perfect climate. She didn't have to go to Publix to go grocery shopping. Just reach up and pick food from the tree. And here's what I want you to hear above all. You know what? She had a perfect husband. There was no sin in Adam, right? She had no need whatsoever. Eve needed nothing. And yet, the serpent was able to come along and create discontentment in her heart. Why do you think Jesus said, be careful what you listen to? We are all susceptible. The Word of God will build faith in your life. If you listen to the world, it builds fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Fear comes by hearing and listening to the world. It's the truth. And you will be desperately in need. You will have fear that you won't have enough money, that you won't have a good job, that you won't have... You'll be in constant fear. But if you listen to the Word of God, you will have perfect peace. A peace that passes understanding. There's no worldly reason. You don't need a worldly reason for peace. Do you know that that guy in North Korea that runs that country, now I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I know this to be true. That guy is nuts. <laughs> I heard Akademijad, the, the president of Iran back then when he came to the United Nations in New York and give a speech for half an hour. It wasn't a speech, it was a sermon. He preached a sermon for half an hour. And talked about the Muslim, that, that radical Muslim goal of the end of the world to come. These are guys that would, if they had the power, if they felt comfortable, they would send, they would send nuclear missiles right now. And I want to tell you this: that if they were to launch nuclear missiles right this minute and aim them, perfectly aim them, at Winter Park Church here in Winter Park, I'd have no fear. I'd have no fear. Do not fear those who can kill the body. Did you never hear that? Jesus said, He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Eternal life. That is the free gift of God. I have nothing. If I don't have to fear death, what do I have to fear? Do I look like I don't have food? You know what? You're not supposed to laugh at that. I know. But what's the matter with me? I mean, we've been living by faith for years and years and years. When we go places, I can remember when we were down in Belize in Central America when we lived down there and I used to do a Bible study at the American Embassy. And I had been invited to go stay in the Cayman Islands for a while and start a Bible study group there. So we had been out of, the, out of Belize for a while and uh, we came back and I met this guy on the street, this guy from the American Embassy. And he said, oh, hi, we were looking for you. Where, how have you been? And, he said, where have you been? I said, well, we've been staying in the Caymans for a while. And he knew we had absolutely no money, absolutely no income, no way to do any of this stuff. And he looked at me, and he said, how do you do that? And I stopped and I thought, I have absolutely no idea. 
I have absolutely no idea. But I can tell you what I know is that when God shows us a need in our lives because he's called us to do something, he always supplies that need. Before I can think, before I can ask, he takes care of it. He is faithful. He is a God that gives us hope. You have no needs. Now that may sound like a silly statement. The only need that you have is Jesus Christ and what he brings to you through the Father, from the Father. It says, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. The world is constantly trying to convince you that you are burdened by so much need in your life. And you're not. Because you have a rich daddy. You don't have any need that he doesn't have enough to cover. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in it. Do you not understand? And if he loved you so much that he would give Jesus Christ in your place, what good thing would he withhold? Isn't that what it says? So often we confess the needs that we think we have. Oh Lord, I may get fired at my job. I need some favor there. And I, you know, Don't misunderstand me. God's never going to get upset with you for asking those things. But you know there's something better. There's something better than going before God and asking him to provide food for your table. It's not wrong to do that. Did he not say, give us this day our daily bread? But I'll tell you what. He wants to mature us. He wants to grow us to that place where we can sit down at an empty table and start giving thanks for the food that he will deliver. I promise you, we are to be able people of thanksgiving. As long as you are convinced you're in need, you're going to have a hard time giving thanks. Unless what you understand that what you have need of is just a closer walk with him. That's all you need. That's all you need. We sing these songs. We sing these words. Are they really the revelation of our heart? Are they coming from the abundance of our heart? If I have a close walk with you, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Adam and Eve, because they sinned, they were kicked out of the presence of God. Joy, peace. That knowledge doesn't come from the world. It comes from walking close to, to Jesus. It says, do not love the world or the things of the world. Where did I hear this today? In the Bible study this morning. You know, Robert says to me all the time when we we'll chat on, over the phone, we must have the same Holy Spirit. Because it's amazing how often something will be going on here. It's exactly what's going on in our ministry over in Bible talk. Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Has anybody ever come up to you and said, oh man, you look around at what's going on in the news and say, what's this world coming to? Anybody ever say that to you? I got an answer. An end. That's the answer. That's the answer. It says in 2 Peter, this present world is reserved for destruction by fire. This world is coming to an end. And every day, you know, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I have a sense that it's not far off. But I don't know when he's coming back. But I'll tell you one thing, it's closer today than it was yesterday. And that's a fact. And when I see these things happen in the news, I say, that's another step closer. Even so, come Lord Jesus. God wants to change your desire. Is there a cost? He doesn't charge you. Oh, you are thirsty. Come and drink without cost. But there's a plan. In Job, Job had some problems. Do you know that? Job had some situations going on in his life. You ever read the book of Job? 
Do me a favor, take a survey here. Has anybody in here ever read the book of Job? Okie dokie, look at that count. That fellow was having a, some issues. You know, and his friends, he had three friends, sympathizers. Can I tell you something? When you're having problems in your life, afflictions, the last thing in the world you need is sympathizers. You don't need somebody to come up and pat you on the back and say, oh, poor baby. You need somebody like Elihu in the book of Job come up and give you the word of God, speak to you in power. Say, rise and be healed in the name of Jesus Christ, not poor baby. We need the word to stir up faith in our life. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, that's a fact. It's also a fact that the Lord delivers us from them all. Weeping may last for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. While you're walking in the darkness, you're going to have more problems than you can deal with. But you know, we're supposed to be children of the light. We're supposed to be walking in the light. If you're having an affliction in your life, before you pray and seek God, they ask, why don't you say what Isaiah spoke to you? What God spoke to you through Isaiah? Arise, shine forth, arise. For your light has come. The glory of God has risen on you. You're not in the darkness anymore. You should be walking in that joy that comes in the morning, in the light. When the light shows up, the joy comes. Get out of the darkness. Start walking in the light of the Word of God. His Word is a light. His Word is a lamp. It is the light that will cast away all the darkness, where all the weeping is. It says in the Bible, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light. Ephesians 5 8. Jesus said, I came and I spoke. These things I have spoken that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I can stand here and ask you, Do you have needs? But let me ask you another question. Do you have joy? Are you walking in that joy? It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We are to be that people of thanksgiving. Alice and I. Everybody say hello to Alice. Hi, Alice. Hello, Alice. Alice. Say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Alice and I have been married for 47 years, 10 months, 2 weeks, and 3 days. Give or take a few hours. For some of you, that may sound like a long time. Some, some of you may be longer than that. But I've shared this before. That when I'm doing something and Alice walks into a room, my heart beats faster. She lights up my life and makes my heart beat faster. I don't know what to think of that. But you know what I think of that? I'm so glad. Because it reminds me every time that that is a verse from the Song of Solomon. And it's about God speaking, the bridegroom, and us, the bride. That we make his heart beat faster. Do you ever think of something like that? Nobody seems to want to preach out of the Song of Solomon. It's not religious enough. The church is too religious. It is not about stained glass windows. It's not about padded pews. It's not about pipe organs. It is about a love affair with Jesus Christ. And if he doesn't light up your life, you're going to have more needs than anybody can handle. But if you walk in the love of God, walking hand in hand, walking closer, I promise you, needs are not going to be what you're fixed on. Your eyes will be fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. You will be walking in victory. Paul said we walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Look what he went through. How many times do you see Paul complain about what's going on in his life? He boasted. Not in himself. If any man boast, let him boast in the Lord. He boasted in his love. God wants to change your life. 
Christians are not walking. We can give testimony. We should be giving testimony. The saints overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But our lives outside those doors should be a living testimony. People should look at you and say, why do you have such peace with all that's going on? Why are you so joyful with all of this going on? How can you get fired from your job and walk out with a smile on your face? Because you can't get fired, you can only get transferred if you work for the Lord. We have to change our attitudes. We have to change the way we see what we need. A number of years ago, you know, we have ministered in Africa, in West Africa and East Africa. And I had proposed a plan to put together to try and help the church in Africa with some economic development. And in doing that, I approached a number of business people here in the U.S. and I visited some of the uh, universities. And I visited one of the most, I guess I can name it. I don't know if you're familiar with Pepperdine University. Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. It is a beautiful, beautiful school, beautiful campus, right there on the hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's, it was founded by a Christian denomination, kind of a, a staid old Christian denomination. And I had an appointment with the dean of the School of Business. And they have a graduate school of business there at this college, this university, that literally places interns in, in most of the Fortune 500 companies. This is a very famous school and one of the highest rated business schools in the United States. And it is nominally at least a Christian, Christian school. So I had an appointment with the dean of the business school, a woman. And I met with her in her office alone, just she and I in her office. And she didn't know me. Uh, we'd had some conversation you know, back and forth by phone, by email. And one of the first questions she asked me is, what are you? Now, her question was referring to what denomination am I? You know, am I kind of the same denomination as them? And I thought about that question for a moment. Because I want to be honest. You know, we're all called to speak the truth in love. She, this is a woman who is, I mean, pretty high up in the annals or the university. And I looked at her and I said, I said, I'm a radical, fanatical child of God, Bible-believing child of God. And it, she kind of stopped and looked at me and she said, what? I said, I am a radical, fanatical, Bible-believing child of God. Now, you can give a lot of answers to that question. You can say, well, I'm a Southern Baptist. I am a brethren. You can say anything you want. But you had better be a radical, fanatical, Bible-believing child of God if you want to walk in victory in Christ Jesus. Now, radical has come to have a very, very bad connotation in the world that we live in today. Is that not true? Why do I rejoice in it? Because radical comes from the Latin word, same thing as radish. It's the root. And let me tell you that the Church of Jesus Christ has to get back to the root. And the root is Jesus Christ and his simple teaching in the Word of God. Now, worse than radical is fanatical. People say to me, oh, you're a fanatic. I say, thank you. You know where the word fanatic comes from? Everybody who knows where the word fanatic comes from, raise your hand. Okay. It comes from the Latin word phantom. And the Latin word phantom literally means in the temple. Back in ancient days, People who spent all their time in the temple were called phantom or fanaticos. People who spent their time outside the temple, well, they were called profanum. Anybody recognize that word? Profane. Profane comes to mean things that are outside the temple. Fanatic is about stuff inside the temple. Now, I have to tell you, my life has changed. I'm not in the temple anymore. Hallelujah. I am the temple. I am the temple of the living God. How much more fanatical can you get than that? Why are we ashamed? Jesus, I mean, spoke through Paul, and Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be fanatics. The world's fanatics go out and kill. 
We are fanatics who go out and bring life because we have been entrusted with the words of life. We have been entrusted with the word of God. We have been entrusted with the love of God. Been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You need to be radical. You need to be fanatical. You need to go out and change that world outside those doors. You have been entrusted with that mission by God. You don't have to have an ordination. You don't have to have a confirmation. You need the Holy Spirit. And if you're sitting here today and you don't have this Holy Spirit, you're watching and you don't have the Holy Spirit, let's pray when you say what your need is because that's your need. Not food, not clothing, not jobs. Your need is the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said that his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. You want joy? Get in the Word. Don't go buy a lottery ticket and start hoping that something happens. Get in the Word of God. How many of you ever heard of Jeremiah referred to as the weeping prophet? Yes? Then why does Jeremiah say, Thy words were found, and I ate them. They came, became for me the joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by thy name. God's word gave Jeremiah joy and delight. The man was filled with joy and delight. His spirit was sound. His spirit was solid. Anybody in this room ever hear of Henry David Thoreau? Okay, Henry David Thoreau. One of the most famous writers, actually, in the United States, in Walden, back in the 1850s. He said, the mass of men, the majority of men, lead lives of quiet desperation. You know that the mass of people outside these doors, the mass of people in this country, this America, the mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation, despair. Do you have any idea how many hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, are spent on pharmaceutical antidepressants in this country? When Jesus stands there at the door and knocks, as I came that you would have joy and that your joy would be made full. They think they have a need. They do have a need, but they're looking in all the wrong places. A lot of times Christians, good brothers and sisters, Bible believing brothers and sisters, you think you have needs. You think you have needs like food and clothing. You have no need. The only need you have is to trust in God who promised that he would meet those needs before you could think or ask. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. I can't tell you how God's going to do everything. You know, we're talking about Robert, our dear brother Robert, who is not here with us today. He's in the hospital. Has anybody said to him, oh, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news. I don't know, you know, God can use doctors and nurses and hospitals and medicine. He can. Or he can just speak a word. But if you don't hear that word, if you don't hear the voice of God say to you, rise and be healed, you're not going to rise and be healed. And I, my prayer for your dear husband, my prayer for your husband, is not only he's going to walk out of the hospital. I think that's a given. I don't want him to walk out of the hospital. Say what? No, I want him like that man who was lame, born lame, who was sitting on the temple steps when Peter came along and said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give you. Rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. And he says he went walking and leaping and praising the Lord. I want Robert to come out of that building walking and leaping and praising the Lord. A living testimony. Not to the doctors, not to the nurses, not to the building, but to our living God. If he has a need, God will meet it. God will meet it. It's time we started giving thanks, standing strong, and giving thanks and saying how we trust in God. I have a need in my life. I need to be more like him. I need to be closer to him. I want a cleaner heart than I have. Those are the things that I need in my life. 
I want a hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's a need I have in my life. And that will bring total, complete, and absolute satisfaction in my life. Get your mind off the world and the things of the world. Set your mind on the things above. Is that not a verse? Fix your eyes on Jesus the Christ. That's a verse. Stop worrying about what you got in the grocery cart. Stop worrying about what's coming in your paycheck this week. Start giving thanks for the things that you think you need. God is in control of those things. The world outside, that profane world, has no satisfaction. I don't care who sings. They were right. Those guys, I can't believe it. 50 years they've been singing that song. And they still can't get no satisfaction. Somebody tell them. Get on the phone today when you get out of here and call. And say, Give me the Rolling Stones. Tell them. They have a need they're not even conscious of. Because so many people have gigantic needs and they don't even know it. Do you have a need here today? Do you have a need? We're going to pray. We are going to pray. Do you have a need? Think about what you need. Don't be glib. Don't be quick. It says be quick to listen, slow to speak. Think about what you really need in your life. And then pray like David did. Create me a clean heart. Think about what that person who wrote those words so long ago prayed when he said, just a closer walk with thee. That's my plea, Lord. That's my plea. That's my desire. God will give you the desires of your heart. That's his desire. He loves you. He wants to give to you. He wants to give to you the things that will actually bless you. Not that the world says will bless you. Come to me, all you with pain. Come and see, call on my name. I will give you Rest for your soul, let me touch you, make you whole. I've seen your suffering, heard what you pray, 